now introduce our speaker, Vicky Gorton, uh, who's been doing her PhD in educational research for three years. Three years. Um, she's actually um, doing it in, P um, in educational research and in lecture as well in the Environment Centre for Environment Supervision. And Vicky's going to be talking to us today. You can see her title there: "Getting to Know Quantitative Methods." The multiple faces of quantitative methods in higher education social science subjects. Mm. Over to you. Thank you, and well done. I'd like to create a long title to the mouthful <laughs> for anyone who wants to talk about it. Um, so today I'm going to give you kind of a rough overview of where we're going to go. So I'm going to talk about the world of numbers we live in briefly as a kind of way into this kind of topic. Um, I'm going to talk about how I'm redrawing this world uh, to be a different world. Um, we'll talk about two kind of characterizations of the quantitative methods, which I'm going to use an analogy of the duck and the rabbit, which is a gestalt image. Um, then talking about the words that people use about quantitative methods. Um, so is it a fact or is it a fiction or a fantasy? Those are, I should also mention that all of this is a work in progress. So if I change words halfway through, it's because I'm not yet certain of what words I'm going to use. Um, and then finally, I'll just sum up with um, concluding points about representing quantitative methods and boxing them up in a new way. Um, so to talk about a world of numbers, obviously numbers are all around us on this slide. It's covered with numbers, um, so we're quite used to seeing them. Um, in, it's, I always feel a bit uh, tired of repeating these same things because it gets a bit dull, but obviously I'm sure you're all aware that there's an increasing need for quantitatively skilled individuals in the workplace. Um, so there's been a huge increase in the number of jobs. Um, and yet this is coupled with also statistics reporting that half of students fail GCSE maths and only 15% take it in some form after a GCSE in the kind of UK or well, technically in England. Um, and so there are these kind of two things of this skills deficit is commonly termed. So we need more quantitatively skilled individuals, and yet people aren't doing those skills or studying them. Um, and so there have been kind of two approaches to solve this. Um, generally, it's framed as a problem of education. So you need to train more people, then you'll have more people going out from education to the world of work with these skills. Um, and you can criticize that um, framing, well, if you will. Um, but two responses to that, one of which has been the kind of huge increase in funding for STEM subjects. Um, so we've had a talk here about um, encouraging girls into physics and that kind of thing. So there's been huge amounts of money pumped into getting more people to study STEM subjects. So um, that's one approach. And then the second approach is money that's been funded to try and encourage social science students to use um, quantitative methods in their research and within both in undergraduate and within postgraduate studies. Um, so QSTEP is the huge project that is a collaboration of the Nuffield Foundation, the ESRC, and the HEFC, if you pronounce it like that, um, which is a nice pot of 15.5 million pounds spread across 15 centres within the UK, funding um, good practice teaching and new modules and work placements, and there's a wide variety of things that are done under that. Um, so are those kind of, there's this framing that it can be solved uh, through a, improving education. Um, but the problem with that is that it sort of assumes that there's, well, they assume that there's a market failure to attract students and teachers into quantitative methods um, training. Um, the key word there is market failure. So they, they're framing this in a particular way that you can just increase this and it's an economic problem. Um, but for me, that sort of leads a question. What I kind of think it'd be nice if it was a bit deeper than people just aren't interested in quantum methods or the teaching isn't good enough or this. So I sort of got interested, from, interested in that question from that point of view. What do we know about this? Um, this kind of world of statistics and quantitative methods. Um, I should say that while I'm using quantitative methods, I'm using it in the broadest sense possible. So I'm talking about numbers, I'm talking about statistics, mathematical modeling, basically anything you can think of. Um, but obviously in different disciplines, it's termed different things. Um, but this world is often characterized as being a hard world. So you have textbooks, which are statistics for people who think they hate statistics or statistics without tears. It doesn't make it sound the most appealing of um, subjects, or it tells you something about what people think quantum methods are about. 
Um, and so here, students unsurprisingly often rate them as one of the hardest modules they take during their degree. Um, it, there are problems with quantitative reasoning, there are problems with quantitative or numerical thinking, and then there's this kind of mathematical statistics anxiety that people have written lots of research about, um, and that's just from the student side of things. On the staff side of things, staff struggle with similarly mathematics and statistics anxiety. So often teaching staff, their background is not necessarily in quantitative methods, certainly in applied social science subjects, um, and yet they're expected to teach it. So they can have a fear of teaching something that they're not an expert in. Um, they have also the kind of problem of having mixability classes, um, limits on teaching time. So often you have to cover a huge width of, or breadth of material in quite a short 10 week slot sometimes. Um, and then if you speak to staff, a lot of them talk about heavy workloads. So quantitative methods modules tend to be different to other modules in that they have a lot of continual, feed, uh, continual yeah, feedback. Um, so you have lots of things to mark, and which is good if you think about it in terms of teaching practice, but obviously from the staff point of view, it can involve more work. And you're often having students coming to you outside teaching hours because they want the support. Um, so they're quite difficult modules for both staff and students, uh, either way you look at it. Educational research has obviously had its opinion on these things and has come into solving this problem. So how do we conquer this world, I've termed it, um, hence why the little Lego figures with swords and things. Um, but there are two kind of key uh, papers or key work um, done in this. Um, one was originally by Garfield, and then the other one is she teamed up with Benzi, I can't pronounce that, but um, anyway, and they've come up with six key principles of how to teach quantitative methods, or statistics in this case, um, more generally, in, in, it's not really about um, social science subjects, um, <laughs> but they emphasize that you have to do practical doing of these, of these techniques, um, it must be practice, so you can't just do it once, you have to keep doing it over and over again, um, that errors in that doing will help you learn, um, that you should receive feedback, which again, as I mentioned, is slightly problematic. Um, technology, they have an interesting point, which is technology should be used to aid visualization and exploration of data. So the keyword there is aid, and they don't suggest that you can replace learning with technology, which sometimes some researchers can be keen to suggest that you tailor learning through one uh, kind of app or online. System, but they're, they're sort of saying that it can't be replacing the teaching. It can just be sort of aiding um, exploration of data. Um, they also explain that there can be difficulties in learning probability, um, which is often estimated. And there's quite a big literature about the kind of topics out there that students really struggle with understanding. And basic elements of probability is one of the biggest issues. And it's not this is something that humans in general struggle with. It's not necessarily about students. So we have, as humans, struggle with these kind of numerical reasoning problems sometimes. Um, and that similarly, finally, the student understanding is often overestimated. Um, so there's an assumption that you, the teacher, know it. The, teach, the student will also know it, which, as I've observed in some of my research, I'm terming kind of hidden knowledge, um, which is that often this teaching staff will explain things and they will think they've explained everything to solve the question, but it's not actually that that the students struggle with. The students will struggle with elements they haven't mentioned, so converting units, which if you're explaining how to do, um, like a, I don't know, a mathematical model, you might not necessarily try and go back to the basics of how to convert the units. So the, student, the staff will assume that the, the students have got a much bigger problem with how do they construct this model, what are the elements, when actually the student is just struggling because they don't know how to go from this kind of first step of the series of processes. Um, and then other literature wider, more generally, has talked about embedding skills across the curriculum, so not just having what's termed bolt-on um, modules, which is where a quantum methods is just in one module that's separated from the rest of the curriculum. They suggest that if you embed it across the, the kind of teaching, that's been shown to have much better uptake and uh, students see the relevance of it um, more than if it's separated. Um, the second point is about using real data sets, um, which is there's this idea that often math, mathematics in more than statistics, but similarly use very general examples that 
can sometimes seem completely alien and in using real data sets you actually start to understand and work with the kind of techniques a bit more uh, closely. And then also if you're thinking about this as an educational problem, there's obviously the, the impact of designing um, assessments and your teaching that will improve statistics, li literacy, reasoning and thinking, which are described in the literature as being three different things which all are needed to be good at quantitative skills. Um, so there's quite a lot of literature about um, the how to teach and the how to learn these things. However, my point here is that this is just one telling of the situation. Um, this is obviously a construction of the world. I've used here the image of a tube map just to illustrate this point. Um, but it has certain limitations or certain assumptions, I would say. So these narratives that are told are devoid of cultural attitudes. There's been a huge push towards adopting um, teaching strategies that are used in China, for example, where they're doing really well in quantum methods teaching and applying them here. And the idea that you can just take something and take it away from the cultural uh, situation that it's embedded in, I have a real problem with. Um, secondly, it assumes that there's a non-problematic transfer of knowledge. You simply have to find the way to teach students and they will accept it. It will, it becomes about just solving them, finding the right, you know, piece to solve the problem or the right tool to teach them with. It's not, it assumes that there is a fix. What happens if you question that and say, there isn't going to be a fix? What if you move away from thinking about it as in fixing the problem and thinking about it as, I don't know, there are different ways of thinking about it is what I'm trying to say. Um, similarly, there's this idea that it's all about humans. Um, so all of the time, I've been talking, I've been talking about students and teachers, or, you know, call them what you will, um, but there aren't just these things in the teaching environment, and quantum methods is particularly, you could argue, has more non-human actors than some other teaching. I wouldn't necessarily argue that, but obviously there are things like computers, there are software, there's worksheets, there's pens and paper, there's whiteboards, there's all this kind of other things going on that most of the, well, all of the literature, I would say, on quantum method teaching tends to ignore or it foregrounds the teacher and the learner. Um, so there's, there's this huge area that we're not looking at. Um, and then finally, which is sort of a signpost to what my talk's going to be on, um, it assumes there's a unified thing called quantum methods. So the funding, the Q-step funding, is for all the social science subjects, and it assumes that quantitative methods is understood as quantitative methods across those social science subjects. Whereas if you actually talk to people, they will use different words. Uh, economists will call quantitative methods econometrics. Some of them will say that's not quantitative methods. Um, psychologists will use statistics, but some will say more broadly quantitative methods. Um, other disciplines have other kind of things. For example, geography. Um, GIS, so geographical information systems, are often sort of on the boundary between being a quantum method and not. So there are lots of these different things that different disciplines are using that could be termed quantum methods but are often forgotten about or we all assume that we know what this thing quantum methods is and if you talk to people about how uh, the curriculum is, actually I won't say that now, uh, <laughs> there's just, if you Get, start to unpack this a little bit and go a bit deeper, you see that they're not just one thing. And often policy documents won't necessarily define the words they're using on quantum methods or statistics, which is really, I find really strange, um, or sort of assumes we all know what we're talking about. Um, so the question then, if I'm saying this is one way of drawing, how do we then redraw and move to a different understanding of what this thing called quantum methods is or could be? Um, for me, I'm using Active Network Theory. Um, now, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time going over what uh, Active Network Theory is. Um, it developed in the kind of 80s um, as a response to Kuhn, who was way, way before that, um, and the Strong Program of Sociology, um, both of which were basically explaining how knowledge is created and it's, it's uh, the processes that are involved in it. It's, it's not just going out and finding theories or well, not really finding, coming up with theories. These theories are about people and about cultures and about this kind of process and sociology is associated with it. Um, Active network theory also stems from ethno-methodology um, and continent continental philosophy. Um, 
which is quite important because most of it is based around the idea of uh, networks and relational thinking, which Western philosophy or I'm not sure what the, the other type of philosophy uh, doesn't tend to engage in. Uh, continental philosophy, it's much more commonly used. Um, so things like Deleuze and Guattari, their idea of uh, rhizomes instead of trees of knowledge, um, which is suggests that you start from a point and everything gets more complicated. It doesn't go the other, the other direction. It's the opposite from the tree, which is where you start off from complicated and you get to this great, grandiose kind of abstract idea. Um, so it's about complexity, um, basically. Um, to define it is a little bit difficult. Um, Law describes it as a ruthless application of semiotics, and that quote is used constantly, um, probably because it sums it up quite nicely. Um, semiotics is simply about um, the signs or that everything is made up of relations. Um, so the meaning of things, there is no kind of essence of a thing. Its essence is in relation, is, is created through its relation to something else. Um, so you can already start to see where this idea of a network is coming from. Um, and then Law and Singleton have described it as a sensibility, a set of empirical inferences in the world, a worldly practice or craft. So this again suggests that actually network theory is not really a theory and it's not really a method. Um, it's more a, a sensibility, I think they term it, um, about a way of looking at the world and things that we should pay attention to. Um, Act network theory has a kind of common terminology that's used. Um, so the first paper that was written on it was about translation. Uh, sociology of translations was the original kind of term for the theory, um, which Callon was writing about scallops and how we protect scallops or how fishermen, scallops and researchers had to club together to save the scallop and increase scallop farming and that type of thing. So it's about translating of actors' goals. So in that case, there were three actors, each of which had their own goals. They had to communicate across those actors. And the relational term is enrollment. Other actors have to enroll other actors into their worldview. So you create this, everyone's talking the same language, basically. Um, and those are two kind of key processes that actor network theorists are often interested in, because that's how the power dynamic works. Um, this all leads to kind of the idea of a black box, um, which is another commonly used term about act network theory, which is sometimes causes a bit of confusion. Um, law, and not law, Latour likes to talk about black boxes as unpacking black boxes, and that's what act network theory does. It, it opens it up, and you can see inside um, this thing. What he's trying to say is that meaning is always taken up into objects. And using act network theory, or by getting into these objects a bit more, we can start to understand them as their relations to other things. Um, and then finally, Latour has also written a, a nice little paper about gun crime. It's not titled that, but he uses a, a metaphor of guns and gun crime and suggests that uh, often it's about, it's framed as guns kill people, not people. The other reverse is people kill people, not guns. These are the two kind of classic American argument or group arguments, whereas Latour suggests that it's neither of those scenarios. In, in combining a, a human with a gun, you create a thing that can uh, contribute to gun crime. You cannot, each of those actors has different goals when they're separated. When you put them together, it becomes a new hybrid actor, which has a different set of goals or changes uh, the actions that can be performed. So this is the idea, again, of that that it's the relations between things and that things might not necessarily be individual um, before they're, well, that they can be combined as well as having a, an individual identity. They don't, their essence will change. Um, so what are the implications of all of this um, huge abstract philosophy? Um, well, it suggests that we move towards a performative idiom of thinking about research rather than a representative one. Um, so I would argue that a lot of research is about a representative uh, idea of what is going on. Um, by that, I'm using Pickering's terms. Pickering is a, a research in science and technology studies, or a philosopher, um, and he suggests this idea of a performative narrative that we want to be telling, or could move to telling, which is about the powers, cap capacities, performances that are situated in material agency, um, so that science the teaching, the doing of science is not just about 
representing the world or producing knowledge or corresponding to the world. It's also about these other power dynamics and everything else that's going on. Um, so they, that in using actual network theory, you're shifting towards a more kind of, um, well, thrift would term it a lived um, idea of the kind of environment you're looking at. Um, so thrift and Dewsbury suggest that this movement towards performative that's happened across many different disciplines, it's not just actual network theory, um, is about uh, an interest in embodied ideas of what's going on. So here, embodying the teaching environment um, or learning environment. Um, and new potentialities, so the idea that it's not just humans uh, that are doing things. Um, the other implication of this is, is, as I sort of hinted at, an acceptance of multiplicity and complexity. Um, so related to that, in my work, I'm using Harvey's um, space, theories of space, which suggest there are more than one type of understanding of space and time, um, which can overlap in different ways, and um, it gives you a different way of looking at the world, basically. So none of, we shouldn't really take for granted how we view the world. We should be constantly reinterrogating these things. And similarly, kind of complexity, there is the idea that there can be more than one narrative of a situation and that that is okay, um, or that we should have a sort of acceptance of complexity as just being in the world. Um, so the question I always get asked um, is why active network theory for this particular research project? Um, for me, active network theory is relational, so it relies on a network thinking. Um, it foregrounds both humans and non-human actors, which, as I've already argued, is missing from the literature. And it understands the networks as dynamic and performed. Um, so it's, they're, they're constantly being constructed. Um, so it, basically, active network theory, this is the picture in the bottom left, it's just a way of focusing, changing the focus that we as researchers have on a particular situation, as any theory does. Um, to give you a brief overview of active network theory in education, um, there isn't a lot of it, really. Um, Fenwick and Edwards have written a nice book that summarizes most of the research that's done in active network theory, um, and they term three different movements of it, so active network theory, post active network theory, and A&T-ish. Um, and they describe it as a way of intervening in educational issues. I'm not using active network theory as a way of intervening in the issues. I'm using it as a way of reconceptualizing what's going on. Um, so that's a point to note. But you could use it to intervene and interrogate these networks. Um, uh, they, the literature for me tends to be about either educational scholars arguing that active network theory should be used or about how we can map the networks that are involved in teaching and learning environments, or how we can look at the particular actors and the goals they have. So the literature tends to separate whether we're looking at actors or networks, which if you're using actor network theory, I find a bit problematic, because surely you should be looking at least in part to both. Um, anyway, to get kind of more to point, my research questions are very broad. Um, so I'm looking at what are the actor network kind of networks that make up quantum methods, and then how do these vary between disciplines? Um, here, I'm only going to be talking about the first question. So what are the active networks that make up quantitative methods? Um, and it's already too broad to talk about all here. Um, so what did I do? I did observation, document analysis, interviews, and concept mapping um, across four different disciplines within one um, education, uh, not education, within one UK university, um, which were 16 modules. Those modules were both quantitative methods, pure quantitative methods modules. They were also um, more applied modules that were embedded within the curriculum. Um, and there was one module which was a qualitative uh, module. Um, and that was done purposefully because often research on quantitative methods can be just looking at one particular module out or one type of module. Um, so the interest was looking at how these things create disciplinary narratives. Um, and the other point I'm always asked is why social sciences? Um, that's a direct response to a paper that was published saying we need more research on how it's taught in social sciences, not in the sciences. Um, so yeah. So to give you a brief image of what concept mapping is, for those of you that aren't familiar, concept mapping is just a way of representing organized knowledge. Um, here is a, a concept map drawn by one of my participants, a student uh, in criminology. And so the top is her original diagram. Um, 
And then the bottom one is the redrawn one using a piece of software um, using CMAPS. Um, and so basically, you have ideas, and then you have links to ideas. It's all very networky, um, and it's a good way of getting people to start talking about these things. So I, when I was doing my interviews, I didn't want to say, so could you tell me about quantitative methods in your discipline? That I opened with getting them to talk about their discipline and seeing where they position quantitative methods in relation to that. So here, this participant has put it in, that she's written in quantitative and qualitative at the top there, um, which instinctively tells you that already she's starting to see these things as being divided um, and how you can start looking at the relation of that into the rest of the network. Um, redrawing it um, proved useful to some extent because often participants will draw the concept map in the interview but they won't label on all the words they've used um, and when you're analyzing concept maps quantitatively um, there comes, it's important to have links being described as that's, the theory suggests that that is validated knowledge. So unless you describe them. So I was too, kind of, I felt my participants knew more than the concept maps were showing they knew. Um, so that's the kind of overview on the concept map. I also use concept mappings as part of the analysis. Um, so instead of drawing hierarchies of codes, um, I coded all my data um, and then created kind of networked diagrams or concept maps and diagrams of my uh, codes. That's mainly because each of the actors were coded as actors, um, and if you kind of try and collapse those down, it doesn't really make sense in actual network theory. So this is a way of getting the themes that were emerging or the concepts that were emerging from my data to be kind of related. Um, so the two kind of narratives about this, we'll start with what I'm jokingly terming the duck. Um, so here, this image, hopefully some of you will see it as a duck. Um, but the kind of story of it being, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. So if quantum methods has these kind of characteristics, and it probably is quantum methods. But if we unpack that, I'm looking at kind of the characteristics. What does it do to look like that? Um, and then what are the actions um, of quantum methods? So we're going to kind of go through each of those three things for this first idea. So the characteristics of quantum methods, often it's assumed to be linear and fixed knowledge. Um, if you look at these two quotes from staff, they go going up to statistical modeling or up to and including generalized linear models. So there's this idea that you start at this point and you end here, and that is your quantitative methods. That's what we all learn as quantitative methods. Um, and that's assumed to be kind of commonly understood. That these staff don't list the techniques that are included between these two jumps. Everyone assumes that we all do the same thing, right? Um, and the second assumption is that all of this learning is done through doing. Um, so you have to do the chi-square test to learn it, or you have to do your t-test, or it's in the examples in the lectures, it, the lecturers are saying, this is how we do this thing. Um, it's not, this is what this thing is, or anything else. So there are two kind of common, and those equally, you'll notice that they map on quite closely to the literature assumptions that I was talking about right at the beginning. Um, so these common ideas of what quantum methods is. More interestingly, if you think about how does it, what does quantum methods do to look like this? Why, is, why do we have these assumptions? One of the lectures I sat in had this flowchart. Um, and one of the ways that you can fix this idea of being linear and fixed and learn through doing is through using these kind of flowcharts to navigate your students through learning. And students love them and, you know, lecturers love them. I'm not criticizing this as a practice at all. But I'm saying that what that is doing is reinforcing this idea that they are linear, that you just answer these series of questions and it will get you to that test. Um, and similarly, worksheets, in both cases, a lot of the learning in these, thing, in these environments is done through worksheets. Students sit at a computer, you have a worksheet that you complete. That is all, most of the time, is done in a linear fashion. You have question one, two, it relates to question three. Um, so this idea that it is linear. Um, what does it mean to look like this? You can sort of assume that if it is linear and fixed, you should follow a set path. That's kind of sort of an inference from it being linear. Um, and then secondly, through the idea of doing, um, in, in having the emphasis about doing the techniques, it, in, it often becomes about obtaining the right answers. So students, when they have problems, will stick up their hand and go, can you tell me if this is the right answer? They're not necessarily interested in the process of how they got there, they just want to check that they've got to the final point. Similarly, staff equally do this when they wander around and help students. They'll just look over their shoulder and go, okay, what was the answer you got? Um, so it's all, it becomes 
the emphasis shifts from about learning the techniques or about learning the methods to being about numbers, um, which is a kind of key point. But as you're probably already guessing, that's just one way of looking at these things. It all looks pretty um, problematic. Um, so what, how else can we look at this kind of situation that's going on? Uh, there's another side to quantum methods, which I would describe as kind of dynamic or more mischievous, which is kind of hinted at by these quotes. Um, so one student types in the code sheet into, into R and exclaims, yay, like when the final plot is produced. So the software, you can enter data, get it to do something, and it will show you an output. Um, and the student ex explains, I keep forgetting to put quotation marks in, um, continues, keeps going, can, student keeps working through the worksheet. And then one of the other students, similarly next to them, is sat there going, oh, it didn't like that. It didn't, which is an interesting way of thinking, thinking about it. It didn't like that. It's something we all kind of say about that. The computer didn't like what I did. So here, this is a saying that these things have an agency of their own. They're not just passively sat there. The software will sometimes misbehave. Um, sometimes for a reason no one can explain. Um, so that's kind of one. Uh, how does it do this? As I'm saying, um, software comes into a big way of how we think about these things. Um, so different softwares are different, have different abilities to handle data in different ways, um, which here is saying this, this psychology um, in this module was saying about how things are straightforward to handle in R. Um, so again, this software is doing something. We're not, you know, you might not be sure what it is doing, but it has some sort of power. Um, looking at this, um, these are the kind of two outputs from two different softwares. So the bottom is um, R, and then the top one is SPS. Yeah. Um, and what happens when you think about these dynamic interactions of students and software is that it shifts from being about numbers to being about outputs. So these are the tables. So students are, are often into the teaching environment or learning environment. It can be about how do you explain or interrogate this output? What do you make sense of that? What does this, which number do you need to look for in the SPS table is the one we're interested in. It's not necessarily about what that number is. It's about how do you make sense of the things that it's come out with. Um, so there's this shift. But for me, both of these accounts sort of miss something about Active networks, or not about about the kind of active network that's going on, which bothered me. So here, Latour suggests that a good active network theory account is a narrative or description or proposition where all the actors do something, don't just sit there. And if you think about the examples I've given, raw data doesn't tend to. I haven't mentioned that really, which is interesting when you think back to how we should be teaching or how the literature suggests it should be taught in the emphasis on raw data and using that kind of information. So what? I sort of got a bit puzzled by this about, I felt this was going to be a huge actor and it was going to be controlling everything, you know, and yet it didn't seem to be coming through. Um, so I started looking at the words people were using to describe um, statistics or quantum methods. Um, now I should mention that I'm still trying to finish this, so hence why there are no numbers or uh, useful things to explain how many people use these words. Um, this is quite quick, but there's, it tends to be kind of four different ways of using words to describe quantum methods. There's the first two are kind of more passive, so there's the idea of equipping students to use or apply or run these quantum methods. Um, then there's a kind of second element, which is about manipulating um, kind of notation or transforming or performing tests or solving equations or building models. So they're both in there, when I'm saying passive, I'm saying the techniques and the raw data are pretty passive in those the words. The, the action is done by the human actor, not necessarily by the non-human actor, which in this case would be the statistics themselves. Um, but what came out, which I was interested in, was this kind of second story, which is we also use personified kind of words. So about you're introduced to quantum methods, or you have an introductory session. You have you get to know the techniques. So, you know, eventually you'll get to know them and you'll be able to do them. Um, or there's a fami familiarity with them, um, which involves interpreting what they say. Um, and this, this kind of idea of tinkering with the techniques. So it's not necessarily about just following a linear thing. It's about sort of subtly changing them and working with them, um, which starts to hint at this idea that the techniques are doing something and they're, they're not just passively sat there. Um, and then this is related to the final one, which is 
where the kind of fantasy or fiction question comes in, which is where people say that the software is thrown out and, you know, these numbers, or you stick them into the software, you crunch the numbers. Um, people often describe um, things as statistic surgeries, which is an interesting idea that you go to this place and they will diagnose your problem and they will fix you. Again, it's kind of interesting terminology that's being used here. Um, and then one of the participants described um, described what he was using for his research as a beast. The technique was a, it was a beast of a technique, which is a very, it's quite, it says something. And this, this kind of second narrative sort of hints at what I'm starting to think about, which is it's more sort of like a kind of jungle, if you will. And you, the researcher, are trying to work with these techniques or the lecturer is trying to guide you through to work with these techniques, which is if you start to think of students getting lost in the teaching environment, it's because the lecturer is guiding them through this path and they have stopped and they have got lost and suddenly raw data, or in this case, or the techniques are not performing as they should be and they're, they're kind of attacking their idea of what's going on. Um, so there's a much more kind of dynamic interaction of what's going on as soon as you add raw data. It's a messy thing that if you have these linear ideas of what quantum methods are, will start to become problematic for students because they start to get worried because, oh no, it's not performing. Whereas actually, if you assume it's not going to perform, which if you talk to researchers and people who are used to using these techniques, they, they all acknowledge that it's not straightforward, that a lot of the time it is about having to reinterrogate these techniques, having to go back to the textbooks, going, oh, why hasn't this worked? Maybe if I change this. They acknowledge that it's not necessarily a linear process from you start with a test, you do these four steps and you get to there. Whereas for students, in the way that it's being presented, sometimes you could argue that that is the kind of narrative they're getting embedded. It's about kind of this right answer. Whereas if you think about it in terms of the broader research, um, if you're using it in research, certainly, how do you know what the right answer is? Because if you're doing new research, you won't be able to check that right answer. So you need other ways of checking it that isn't just focused on that kind of numerical outcome. Um, so to kind of summarize, um, obviously, well, this is still a work in progress, um, <laughs> so I should say. But what I can hopefully say is that there are m multiple faces or multiple ideas of what quantum methods is. Um, there are different actors which are used to enroll the students into these um, kind of concepts. So there are worksheets, there are flow charts, there are assessments, there are these or other things that are helping achieve these kind of ideas or faces of quantum methods. Um, uh, to, to talk about what I've just spoken about, there's kind of a linear idea and there's a kind of mischievous or playful kind of side of quantum methods. And these two things become then about translated into different um, kind of outcomes. So one becomes about obtaining correct answers or one becomes about interpreting outputs from software and things like that. Um, and then finally, the words we use to talk about quantum methods similarly highlight a multiplicity in our understanding of what this thing is. It's not just one unified concept. Um, and then to kind of end with, there are still problems of using, or I still find it difficult pinning actor network theory down into a linear account. Hopefully I've tried to make it as linear as possible. Um, hopefully you understand what I'm saying. But as soon as you start focusing on networks, you always have to make decisions of where do you start with the network, where do you finish with the network, which path you follow. And acting network theory is, makes it sometimes a bit problematic to try and work all of that out. Um, and I'm still not sure how comfortable I am about telling a linear story for all of these things, because these two images of quantum methods that I presented here overlap at the same time in the teaching environment. There's a constant switch between them. So it's, I presented them here as two separate things, but they are related. Um, and then similarly, I started to talk about blending active network theory with a with Pickering stance of agency, um, which is a theory I vaguely mentioned about the kind of representative and performative ways of understanding. And so blending active network theory with another theory is equally problematic because obviously these theorists have written their theories for a reason. Um, trying to tweak them and trying to use Pickering's idea of tuning, um, which is a much more mechanical idea, is sometimes a bit problematic. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, would anybody like to start us off with a question or an observation? Yes. 
Don't. Um, thanks for that, Vicky. Really, really interesting. Um, it took me back to um, undergraduate days when I did a, a number of modules on mathematics and statistics. So, um, I, I, I think this is a really interesting area, and I wonder. I suppose I'm going to sort of. Um, I'm interested in this sort of boundary, if you like, of 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 quantitative methods and what that means. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm thinking about this in terms of a boundary between mathematical and statistical. Mm -hmm. that, that if you if you start with a mathematical concept, you're you're maybe tending to think about things in terms of exactness. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're tending to think about things in statistical terms, you're thinking about things in terms of probability and confidence. Mm -hmm. so, so you're really starting almost from two different uh, s states, mm -hmm. your conceptual thinking. And I mean, so what I'm, what I'm interested in really is whether, you're, whether your research is, is identifying any of that, whether, you, whether you're picking up whether there are actually tensions in this mm -hmm. between where, whether there is a boundary, mm -hmm. where it is, mm -hmm. and how that boundary is handled. I mm -hmm. mean, I'd be really interested in that. Mm -hmm. I know you, I know you haven't focused on mm -hmm. that particularly, but I, but I think I get the feel that you might have something behind there that could <laughs> answer my question. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you should ask that because if you talk to statisticians, so previously I've done some work before my PhD about how we present statistics to the general public. And if you talk to the statisticians, they see themselves as separate from maths, whereas often, more generally, we'll see statistics as being maths. So it's, it's interesting, this divide. Um, within my own research, some of the disciplines have different ideas. So as I said, psychologists talk about st statistics openly, whereas the economists I spoke to, it's interestingly because what they talk about as statistics, they term econometrics, and what they term as quantitative methods actually tends to be mathematical numerical skills. So they have a distinct divide, so much so that one of the staff members who I tried to interview said, I don't teach quantitative methods, that's not what I do. And then you look at the content of his, the module and you're like, but actually what you're teaching in other disciplines is quantitative methods. So there's this weird, and one of the lecturers I spoke to in criminology um, has a really lovely idea, which was he wasn't teaching statistics. He, adamantly refused to say that. He said he was teaching quantitative skills. So he was teaching a module which was about interpreting data and understanding that, where his focus was on that, not on anything to do with techniques. So then it becomes this interesting point of, is statistics the techniques, or is it the ideas that we have about data? Um, the other point that I would mention is that there's an interesting shift from where or I think there's a shift in quantum methods that it has been about frequentist statistics, which are about kind of more exactness and more mathematical kind of, well, answers and kind of that kind of thing. Whereas what's happening is there's a move towards mathematical modeling and um, that kind of thing within disciplines, which I just said mathematical, I didn't really mean mathematical, because obviously a mathematical model is more mathematical. But that's much more about equations and manipulating those things, which is a totally different concept of kind of exactness and right answers. There isn't really a right answer in a mathematical model. There's just something that you could argue is better or worse. So there's this shift in, within the quantum methods equally of what we think of as quantum methods, um, as well as these different kind of performances in the learning environment or teaching environment. Um, and it's something that will be interesting to see if it changes in the way I think it will change. Um, but you're definitely right, there is definitely a problem or a blurring of that. Mm. So yeah, interesting. interesting. Thank you. Yeah, Jan, and then... Thanks, Vicky. I'm really interested in the idea of agency and the way you've used mm -hmm. it, and particularly the attribution of agency to computer, the worksheet, and all of that. Mm -hmm. It seems to be this sort of, there's four different positions that one can take on this. Mm -hmm. One is that non-human, that, that there isn't agency. Mm -hmm. One is attributing agency in the same way we sort of attribute human characteristics to an animal, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. or the computer didn't like what I did. Mm -hmm. We're not really. The other is, one, then skipping one ahead is mm -hmm. saying, yes, 
these things have agency in the same way we do. And we had last year's seminar program, somebody spoke mm. very much about that. And then I suppose the, the third, the fourth is saying, they have agency, but it's different, human mm. agency. And I'm just wondering, how, and how were you using it? How do you see, or you might you might not accept those four different... No, I definitely, scales, I definitely agree with what you're saying. Um, in what way are you sort of using it? I sort of, I mean, if you apply Action Network Theory at its heart, that's kind of purest, it does stem from a kind of idea of generalised symmetry, which is that we humans and non-humans have the same agency. However, the subsequent writing from Action Network Theory has suggested that there is problematic, that isn't really common sense. Um, and so most of the work now has this kind of, kind of idea that they do have some ability, but it's not the same as us. And the problem I kept coming across with is um, it's really easy if you look at an assessment criteria or you look at a worksheet to go, this worksheet is getting students to do something, but it wasn't, it didn't just come into being from nowhere. Someone wrote this, so it's also really easy, easy with agency to just fall back to whoever created the thing. Um, and it's quite difficult sometimes, or I found it early on quite difficult to deal with that. However, I got around that in my own head by going, I'm actually dealing with quite a precise moment in time. So in, for the students, those assessment criteria are fixed. Those documents are the final things. They're not changing in the kind of environment they are interacting with those things. So they have the agency themselves. Um, I would probably not go to the same extent as saying they have as much agency as humans do. Um, but I'm certainly more on that end of the scale, if you will, than at the kind of other end of the scale. Also because theoretically, I'm using Action Network Theory as a tool to kind of change how we see or how we think about these things. And it's much more interesting to think about these things as having complete agency. You can tell a much more interesting story or a much more dynamic story that's different for what we're used to thinking about. So just theoretically using it as a theory to help explore these ideas, having that kind of extreme end of agency is useful kind of from that positioning. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, uh, it's, it's on the same theme, really. Uh, I've struggling wrestling with like, to network today myself for some years. Uh, and the, one of the controversies, to use the Couture's word, is um, this concept of actants. Mm -hmm. And in some way, sometimes it's presented, I think wrongly in some literature, as a way of smoothing over this idea that man plus gun mm -hmm. equals gunman equals killer. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the two things are not separate, they are the agent. Mm -hmm. And the struggle with recognising that there are things that do things, mm -hmm. so the Pluto controversy, mm -hmm. Pluto affects Neptune, mm -hmm. there is agency, mm -hmm. but is Pluto an actor? Mm -hmm. We would say no, it's not. Mm -hmm. So, actants, does mm -hmm. that help solve the problem? For me, any time of my reading of the stuff that's written about actinomic no theory is that Act and actor are used almost simultaneously, like they're interchangeably. So I wouldn't necessarily see. And if you read Latour's, you know, the, the kind of famous paper about I made a mistake because I made four mistakes about no theory the actor, the theory, the network, and the hyphen, um, where he just goes, all of the words we've used are wrong. But in that, he says that the actor and the agency, kind of, or the actor and the actant words, were just a way of getting around this problem and getting people to think in a different way. Whereas a lot of emphasis has been on which words we use and how we use them. Whereas for him, it was just a kind of technique, almost. Um, so I'm not sure how much I feel that helps. Um, and it is something that I've spent, <laughs> spent three years trying to understand, four years trying to understand active network theory. And I am only just starting to under get, get a feel for it. And trying to explain this to my participants, I, you've, I sort of avoided it because I didn't feel that it was necessary but part of that is because getting to think in terms of actors is kind of really difficult you have to accept everything that goes with it and if you start to question those things you you kind of get lost going down like a philosophical circle of going but this thing like this glass doesn't I'm picking up it like no you just it's really hard sometimes and you, this is the only way I could get to do it is just thinking of it as a thought experiment as going okay, if we accept this, what happens if we run with it? Um, which is a different position necessarily to what some of the actinomic theorists would say, which is that this is 
the position of what the world is. I'm not convinced how I have a more of a relativist point of view. That there are lots of different ways of thinking about the world. This is just one framework of doing it. So I'm not sure about how important the words we use are, um, which yeah, thank you. sort of negative, but yeah. Could I just follow up on, on that particular? I have got another question, but just to follow up on that, because mm -hmm. I'm not on that particular mm -hmm. theory, first of all, I'm just trying to make sense. So, when you, when you were talking earlier, you said um, something about the non human actors, about mm -hmm. computers and pens and paper and things. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, um, for a non expert like me, so you could just perhaps explain how, and it maybe you've just been sort of mm -hmm. beginning to do that, mm -hmm. getting glimmers, but how is that? How are they actors, and and, and, it, and what way, what way are you describing them as acting, mm -hmm. or having an having a sense of agency? Mm -hmm. I can does that make yep. sense to the question. Um, I write a lot better than I speak about this uh, issue. <laughs> it's the first thing I say about that, which is. Um, I would say they're actors because they're affecting how other people are behaving. Um, so the, if you talk to teaching staff, they will say, I've written everything up by hand in my tutorial with a, with a whiteboard and a pen. I go back to pen and paper because it slows my teaching or it slows how I explain it. It creates, it, it illuminates. So in using those tools, it is changing how they're behaving. Um, it's the same, you can take it more generally and say how you behave, there's a classic thing of how you present stood up, how you present sat down. The technology will change how you are behaving in the environment. Um, it doesn't, this is where it's difficult to kind of extend that too far, which is where um, Latour's kind of gun ex kind of thought experiment comes into handy because if you take that too far, it suggests that the, the behavior will always be different, whereas it's not, these things have agency themselves, but they also have agency combined. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that just because I'm sat on a chair, that my agency has totally, my individual agency has been totally lost, and I've become a kind of combined chair hybrid kind of thing. Yeah. So it's a really good example for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually gone through a whole process of how, how I actually do yeah. interact, certainly in terms of how I teach. Yeah. I went through a whole process so I can actually. Mm. Which is take away to think about yeah. it. Thank you. And it's yeah, is that my agent? I'll come back later. But, yeah, was it Helen? Yeah. Yeah, so that was really just mm -hmm. a thought to share, going mm -hmm. back to the very, very beginning, that first mm -hmm. slide of yours. And what was that I was sort of thinking about was that almost that cultural fear we have mm -hmm. in language. Yeah. We recognise the importance of them, we use them to support our art, and, it, and yet we're sort of scared of them. Mm -hmm. Which took me back then to think about, if you like, our whole education system, if we're going back to the very beginning, we're very, very good generally mm -hmm. at recognising, supporting, testing for mm -hmm. dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're not so good at recognising, testing, supporting things like dyscalculia, mm -hmm. difficulties, for any, any sort of difficulty children have with numbers. We tend mm -hmm. to sweep them a little bit under the carpet. Mm -hmm. So is there something then about almost going back to mm -hmm. looking about how number is embedded within our education system, not just at the mm -hmm. education level, but further back down? Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, definitely interesting. And it's interesting because I, I've, been researching kind of statistics and quantum methods, kind of all of my PhD and masters, and I did my dissertation and graduate on it. And it, it was only one of, until one of my participants last year when I actually have dyscalculia and I couldn't get support from the university. They've treated it like dyslexia, so I get extra time in the exam, but they don't actually know what it is and they can't support me because they don't know what it is, or they don't think, you know, the research. I, she was saying that this was a kind of institutional problem which is an interesting idea and something I hadn't even thought about this idea. Much of the, most of the literature is about the statistics or mathematical anxiety. It's not too much about this actual kind of difficulty that, you know, should have equal status as kind of dyslexia. So it's an interesting assumption that these things kind of are brushed under the carpet, which is a weird, or that we just don't know how to help in any, or that I find that hard to believe, we must know, but it's a weird thing that it's not treated in the same way. Um, and 
particularly in the UK, this is why I said about the kind of idea of taking Chinese teaching methods um, and applying them here, is that within the UK, that kind of fear and that it's almost okay to be not good with numbers. You can see it all, the, I could quote media examples all day long about, you know, someone else goes, oh, don't worry, it's okay, you don't have to work that out, you know. So it's embedded everywhere we look, whereas you speak to different cultures, like different, or you travel around, and that kind of instinctual, it doesn't matter, you don't have to be able to do mental arithmetic, as always the example, isn't, isn't global. Um, so there's this also idea that as well as kind of higher education, or education in general struggling with this, that it's something the UK has, and this is why I have an issue with the idea that we can just take these techniques and apply them because we don't have the same acceptance of what's going on or expectations. Um, so yeah, you're ex it's an interesting problem. Yeah, I was interested in, in what you said about, um, I don't know if I'm misquoting you, but um, the difficulty of creating a boundary around mm -hmm. the network that you're looking at, mm -hmm. and which pathways and what do you follow, which networks and where do you stop? Mm -hmm. How did you make those decisions, or are you still making them? Because I find that one of the trickier stuff. But um, I don't know if it's any more difficult than a case study, to know what the boundary is there. Mm. Sure. I'd say it was similar because um, you're in any research you're always making decisions and I would say you should have the same approach or sensibility or uh, kind of sensitiveness I think is the word to those kind of questions whatever theoretical framework you're applying um, however with actor network theory so if I go back to this uh, here it is this slide I had a problem when I started doing the analysis of my data um, because I was generating all these kind of codes. All these bits of paper here are codes. I came up with something like 200 of them and I ended up having to print them out and go, okay, what do I do with them? Because if you think about somatic analysis, you combine them to create an overarching picture and you move up towards a generalized and I couldn't get it to work. So I started doing these network things. Um, and then I had the problem that a lot of these codes were overlapping between the different pictures I was drawing. So it became really difficult and I had to keep redrawing these to kind of go, does this fit better here or does this fit better here? Or I then came to the assumption that actually they can be in, but yeah, in two things at once. Um, but it means that when you try and tell that story, it's really hard to kind of go, okay, right, it's in this thing, but it's also over here doing this other thing. Um, and trying to convey that and writing it up in a kind of a straightforward, I've ended up having to sort of use a kind of, um, it's, I think it's called the Socratean, it's like a dialectic writing style. So you're constantly talking to yourself. Um, and I find that really useful in trying to get through these kind of thinking about these things because certainly in terms of writing, that helps you think through what's going on a little bit easier than just trying to write a narrative um, or a kind of sequence of events. But this is something that, for me, the work that's produced from actinetic theory doesn't really highlight. Um, so often they produce these lovely poetic descriptions of what's going on, and you're like, this is amazing, of course it must be like this. <laughs> and then when you're doing it, you're just like, how did you come up with this story? How did you, how did you create this beautiful account? Because all I can see is a bunch of different interactions that don't, that, I mean, that do make sense, but you've had to choose which one you're going to tell. And I think it's that choosing that isn't necessarily actor network theorists sometimes like to shy away from. And it's probably because most of them are philosophers, or certainly the, the kind of big characters, the big players, are philosophers. And they were using actor network theory as a way of playing with our understanding of uh, the world around us. They weren't using it necessarily to kind of, some of them were using it as a way to kind of change what was going on in the environment, but it started off as a way of exploring philosophical ideas which is why when you start applying it as a method, it starts to become really headachey, and you go, why haven't you talked about this? And they haven't talked about it, because for them it's not, it's not relevant. Um, Can I just ask a quick question? Thank you very much, Vicky, that's really helpful. How have you decided whether you've got enough data? It seems to me it can be. Yeah, it can grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, I stopped collecting data for purely arbitrary reasons of that was the end of term. Um, I found that to be a nice cut-off point. Because obviously if you're looking at these modules, trying to compare what happened in one year as the next year 
it gets really confusing and things start changing. Um, I also personally had a problem because I'm doing a qualitative study, but on content methods, and so you constantly are asked, how many do you need? How many people do you need to talk to? How are you going to test this? And, and I was going to do quantitative analysis on the concept maps on these. Um, so I did count all the nodes, I counted all the links, and was going to do it quantitatively. But to do that, I would need a huge amount more interviews than I got. So the, the number of, uh, so I did 32 interviews, and that's across all the disciplines, which realistically, if you were going to test the differences between each discipline, you'd need 32 interviews from each discipline. So you'd need huge amounts of data um, to be able to test that, and I'm not, it would be interesting, but I didn't have the time or the resources to kind of do that. Um, and equally, I do think there is this idea that you start to see the same things, um, and you definitely, the narratives that emerged, emerged relatively early on, and then you were constantly looking at more data and more examples, and generally, as in any qualitative study, you start to see go, okay, this is reaching a point of saturation or what, you know, obviously there's always more things to be learned, but, and the other point to say is that the modules I was observing, I was observing, observing the lectures kind of at random almost, cause of, just because of timetabling, um, and so I didn't observe like the first lecture for each module I went to, uh, just because that's impractical, um, but it's also interesting because that, again, is shifting, is giving you different moments or different snapshots of what's going on through these different modules, because they're moving through time as well as across years and everything else. So this is why I was doing students as well as the documents, because the students will see it from the point of the entire module. The teaching staff are seeing it as the module of year on year on year. You're seeing it when you go in for observation as kind of a snapshot, as an experience, as a, you know, in that moment in time. So you're kind of overlapping these different understandings of kind of time and space, um, which is where I was trying to do that. Fascinating. Thank um, you. Thank you. Joanne, you have a quick question. Um, yeah, and also Dawn, just to... Um, she, she's gone. Oh, she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know it was a quick one, Vicky. I'm very interested in your analysis, especially in the mm -hmm. concept mapping. Mm -hmm. Can you just clarify a little bit more? You said, I think, that your participant draw the map um, at the beginning and then you kind of analyze it through software. So is it a new map that you interpret, or is it the same map? It's the same map. Right. Can you um, yep. To clarify, I should, I should explain that. I've used concept maps. They kind of got a bit pervasive in my research. So I was drawing my meet, supervisor meeting notes, so agendas for that as a concept map. I was drawing at one point, I was sat in lectures drawing concept maps of the, the lecture structure, because it's interesting because some lectures have much linear trajectories and some have much more networked and as soon as you start drawing that out as a network or as a diagram, you start going, okay, right, all of this is going down the page. Isn't that weird? Which you get that even from kind of PowerPoint presentations, which I thought was slightly weird, but that was pilot study days. Um, for the main study, what I got participants to do was in an interview, start out with a participant drawing a concept map. So I give them instructions of what concept map is, how to draw it, they were given pens, they were given a blank sheet of paper, um, and they would draw whatever they liked. Um, and some of them tended to be more concept mappy than others. Some of them tended to draw a mind map, which is not a concept map. Some tended to be, this could be more of a kind of flow chart concept map than a traditional purist concept map. But I sort of ran with that and went, it's your choice. I'm happy with that. So that's what they came up with. While they were doing that, either they would either explain the concept maps in the setting, or they would then talk about it, talk me through it after they'd finished, which is where I'm saying I then added in all the bits in orange here are bits I added in, which are direct quotes from the interview. Um, and then these, originally I was going to look at all of these redrawn ones, because the, the point of redrawing them using the software is that all of these boxes are the same, all of the lines are the same, you know, you start to start to standardize the process a little bit more, which means you can sort of theoretically quantitatively analyze it. And then traditionally concept maps are organized by their structure, and it's much easier to see the structure in these diagrams than it is in their original drawing sometimes. Um, I didn't, in the end, I haven't focused too much on that because it didn't seem important. I'm not interrogating these concept maps realistically for how well they've produced an answer, if that makes sense. Um, I'm just kind of looking at how they're 
what they're showing is their internal map of what's going on. Um, so hopefully that explains a bit more about what we're doing with concept map. No, that's true. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, looking at, uh, I think my question is going to be building on the uh, Don's, or at least close to Don's point of view. So looking at what quantitative methods is, in my mind, um, comes with the subsequent question of what students think of research or knowledge is and how they um, position mm -hmm. themselves in relation to production of knowledge. Um, and in line with that kind of thinking, um, what happens with quantitative methods usually is that um, the numbers become an authority by itself. So because um, some certain theories or sub, um, subsequent theories are um, approved or denied or like rejected based on the other numbers coming up, um, all of a sudden this understanding becomes quite a um, cherry picking type of thing. Oh, this mm -hmm. um, theory hasn't been proved, so I'm just not going to, I'm, I'm going to ignore this in my um, final analysis or this is a, this has been uh, approved, so it has to be the, uh, something to explain what I'm looking at. So, mm -hmm. was there anything that students were actually um, talking about their authority against the numbers? Maybe I'm not sure that's the best way to put it. But um, what, what are the tension that students were coming up with? Oh, even though you know the numbers are doing this, mm -hmm. I still think that's the other way around, and I have to look at it even further. So. Mm -hmm. You know, is, 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 was there any kind of attention that you got from these students? This kind of thing would be what I would term kind of quantitative reasoning, which is often lacking in students' understandings from these kind of modules. Um, and the, the kind of module that I would say, or the students that I would say did have much more of a kind of partial view of statistics in two different ways with the economists and the criminologists, because the criminologists were really aware that lots of the statistics we have around us are missing huge amount, particularly in criminology, it's the type of research they have to deal with, that if you're researching crime, you can't have a hard and fast number. So they were much more aware of the kind of grey area of what numbers were telling them, and they were much happier with the kind of idea, or they, yeah, happy with the idea that numbers would change, or that, you know, you were picking them, or they were the students that quoted back, oh, it's all lies, and, you know, that kind of idea. Uh, the economists have a slightly different view, which is, for the economists, everything is numbers, based, or mathematics, mathematics. Um, but they have an interesting partiality that goes with that. So they're always saying, we have to validate our models, we have to double check them, you can never have a perfect model. They have a much more kind of happier idea with that, whereas this sort of where you're getting in some of the middle zone is where the students weren't necessarily as happy with the idea of um, wrong answers or that, that statistics could be misused or, you know, they, they almost found that as a tack on the kind of knowledge themselves, if, if that makes sense, so the kind of power of that thing. Um, and it is really true that all of the students I spoke to have a slightly warped idea of what research is like and the narratives that they use to talk about those things. And it's interesting because one of the, the, the qualitative module I watched and spoke to the lecturer for that, he said, What's really difficult is that um, students come in with a quantitative mindset and you have to spend your entire qualitative module trying to get them to stop thinking about representativeness or, you know, sample size. You have to start thinking, but it, if you think that away from that's a classic narrative we all hear, what's interesting about that is it says that there is a quantitative mindset in these students. However, you talk to quantitative lecturers, like methods lecturers, and they say they can't get the students to understand the test. So there's this weird idea that the students have this idea of what quantum method is and what it means to think quantitatively, but that's not actually what the lecturers or the teachers are, or, you know, what it actually is to think quantitatively. So even at the kind of, I haven't talked about it here, but even at the, that kind of broader research narrative level, there are multiple narratives going on that, you know, you sort of have to start to maybe think about trying to align a bit closer and remembering that you're not just trying to teach them tests, which is why it's such a huge issue. And I don't think there is one solution because you can't, in 10 weeks, some of these modules are 10 weeks, you can't teach them everything there is to know about doing research. Um, and all of these other things are factors that will feed into that kind of um, understanding. But it's something definitely that students were coming up with all sorts of crazy answers for. Um, but it was really interesting. But thank you. Yeah. Okay, yes, I'm ready again. Don again after that. Um, I suppose I wanted to put up 
structure. I mean, I found that really interesting. Mm -hmm. and I think you've raised a lot of really popular mm -hmm. issues that you connected with. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask Elizabeth um, where you sort of thought your research was going to be mm -hmm. useful and how mm -hmm. you felt it might connect, because I, I, it, it dovetails with me, as you may know, I do some work with colleagues across the university mm -hmm. who are often involved in developing their modules mm -hmm. for curriculum design. Yeah. And a number of them talk about the very challenge that you've re related, mm -hmm. is it embedding some things within curriculum, mm -hmm. is it having an, industry, a, 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 an individual module, mm -hmm. where does that module fit into the wider mm -hmm. attitude, some of the attitudes you've talked about for students, mm -hmm. how they, they would Say, yeah. well, how do we deal with this and what do we and I just wondered mm -hmm. if you had any thoughts about how your research might be able to contribute to some mm -hmm. of that sort of debate and discussion. Yep. Um, personally I'm quite open in saying that I'm not doing this research to change teaching. Um, and I'm wary about my research being taken up and used as some sort of great thing to solve this problem, which is why I'm being probably overly negative and overly I don't want to get involved because I have no background in educational research. Um, but that said, uh, I think what has to be slightly perhaps made clearer in, in certainly teaching when you're creating modules like this is you have to be clear what your goal is. And quantitative methods modules often do a lot of different things. So there's this idea that they're going to give you transferable skills, they're going to give you skills to do research, they're going to give you ideas of interrogating data. And if you want each of those things to be done, you have to do them in different ways. And perhaps naively, I would say, there's potential to use different kinds of raw data in looking at these things. So if you want to get students to think about numbers can mis be misused, why some of the modules I've seen do use kind of data from the media or, you know, public statistics and that kind of thing, which is really obvious as to there's lots of different ways of telling this. Um, but then equally, if you're trying to look at how these things are constructed, you can use more sort of researchy kind of raw data, that kind of thing. Um, but from my point of view, as I've said, there are multiple different things that quantum methods is, as well as what it should be doing. Um, and I don't necessarily think there is one way of teaching that or making it better. Um, and for me, there's a real difficulty, or it seems to be getting more difficult, not less difficult, about timetabling pressures. Um, and so lots of the staff I spoke to were great at teaching. Uh, they're some of the best lecturers I've seen were at this institute. Um, and it's really difficult because they're being forced to teach in smaller and smaller time blocks. And one of the um, departments was telling me about was that they've had to change their structure from being a 30 credit module to being a 15 credit module because it's better for students that they can fail one or two 15 credit modules. So they were told directly from you know the institution above that they should restructure their modules. But in doing that, it means that stuff starts to get split off and you often lose in doing that shift from a bigger credit module to a smaller, you lose teaching time and you lose everything else. So everything you have to teach becomes forced into, there's also a huge issue and I don't know how you solve it of how you get students to keep knowledge from one year to the next. Because it was interesting across the different disciplines I was in, there's a huge variety of when students are first exposed to quantum methods, whether they're just taught once in their entire degree, whether they're taught every year or whether they're taught across modules. Um, and the risk is that I could say the economists had a much better understanding of quantum methods and much happier, probably because they're seeing it all the time. You can go to any most, probably 80% of their modules and there will be quantum methods there. So embedding is a way to get around that. But the downside is, is that a lot of these disciplines aren't just dealing with quantum methods, in which case then you have to weigh this up as you don't, you have to be able to get the students to switch their thinking or to be happy with qualitative methods at the same time, otherwise you're just sort of creating a, you know, whatever you want to say. Um, so that's also a kind of balancing act that some disciplines don't have as much. Um, and the economists I also spoke to were saying that for them, essay writing skills are the problem area. So they struggle with getting their students to write essay because they've spent so much time with these other skills. So it's almost like there's always going to be a trade-off on which skills you want them to learn. Um, so. I, I'll try the question to mm -hmm. talk to you a little bit further because yeah. I think although I, I, I would endorse your, you know, mm -hmm. as you say, I'm not going to come up with something and think it's the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I have to defend that we would have one way of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think actually there's a number mm -hmm. of things that probably come within your data that mm -hmm. actually would be very useful from both yeah. institutional perspectives.
perspectives and also mm. from Indigenous colleagues' perspectives, yeah. thinking about their teaching, their curriculum mm. design, folks in general principles yeah. that people could be thinking about in yeah. light of. So, um, one or two other tips cool. I can teach mm -hmm. you later. Sounds great. Including indeed within this department indeed. and our teaching. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Don, you have another question. Yeah, it's um, it's a quite sort of different different one from the previous one. It's to do with this idea of quantitative methods now being used to produce um, international league tables, mm -hmm. um, which is you know, quite a uh, topical uh, point, I think, in a whole range of areas, and um, particularly thinking about the mathematics mm -hmm. league tables, if you like. Mm -hmm. Um, things like OECD, PISA, TIMS, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose my, my I, I wondered whether um, I've often wondered with these uh, whether it, it is the mathematical um, ability, if you like, that is being shown, or whether mm -hmm. it is actually much more to do with what you, what I think you would define as quantitative mm -hmm. reasoning, mm -hmm. or whether it's to do with social importance mm -hmm. you know I mean I, I fully agree with what you say about you know the importance in the UK of mathematics is mm -hmm. um, fairly low <laughs> whereas you know in France it's it's mm -hmm. very very much higher and actually the number of miles between us is, is, mm -hmm. is very small um, so you know you, you've got at least those three sorts of mm -hmm. factors and, and which which can have a major influence in terms of things like not only the way that the quantitative methods are mm -hmm. are used and applied, but also the outcomes mm -hmm. of those. And I wonder whether anything that you are finding would is sort of showing up. What what are your thoughts about about that from your findings in terms of how how these things align or don't align? Do, do you have any thoughts on that from what you've done? When you say things, you're talking about league tables. Yes. Yeah, the results of league tables. Yes. I find it, well, most of my, all of my research is in higher education, so I can't really comment about most of them are aimed at schools, um, and there seems almost to be a shifting dynamic of these league tables to tell us something else. And like, I find it really frustrating just on the outside looking at these things, because the media will tell us that we do really badly in these global league tables, whereas actually if you look at them, we're still not, we're in, at least in the top 20 or at least in the top 10 often. That's not too bad. If you translated that to be like your result from a degree, if I was in the top 10 of my class, I'd be pretty happy. So there's this weird, you know, yes, we're not great at it, but equally I don't think we're as bad as the media would suggest we are, as what the politicians like to tell we are. Um, so it's a weird shifting and changing of those, and any of the new tables I've heard about, it's really shaky as to how they've come up with these numbers anyway, and that is so often just kind of pushed to the side, or it's just about this is the number, and this is where the power of statistics come in, it's because it gives you this thing that can be translate, you know, can move around all the time, there's been lots of research about how, you know, numbers can translate themselves, um, but it means that it's often lost from that kind of connection, or it's not really lost, some people just it's not the point of interest as to how they were come up with, or how they came up with these kind of numbers. So there's also that kind of issue. Um, I haven't really done any research outside of the UK, but it would be really interesting to compare about how these kind of narratives are, are they, how they, whether they are the same in different cultures or how much of the narratives that we're coming up with and how much of the problems, I mean, because mathematics and statistical anxiety is, kind of widely documented, but it'd be interesting to see how we think about these things, changes about how that's related to the culture we're in, um, and it would definitely change through your kind of educational trajectory, because I've seen differences between just in my small sample of like undergraduates, masters and PhD students and staff all think about these things quite differently, um, so you don't have, I don't think you'd have to go too far down the kind of spectrum to again start thinking about different things that are being emphasised, um, which again is something that isn't necessarily always discussed in league tables. Like, what do you actually want to be top of? Like, do you want people, you know, because all of these tests are designed with goals in mind, so these tests, uh, you know, you're testing on a certain thing, and that's then being assimilated to create this number about, you know, where we are in terms of the 
world. But for policymakers, this is often about whether those those people will have the skills to go out and be and become a useful employee. That's really what they're interested in. But those tasks aren't necessarily testing them on the skills that they'll use in the education in like the workplace. So then, how much of those details are useful in doing that? It, it's endless questions. Um, so. Which is probably a lovely note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which to end? Um, once again, thanks, Vicky, for your you know fantastically lucid, detailed answers to questions, mm -hmm. as well as for the presentation. Let's give you another clap.